Okay, folks, welcome back to another fascinating lecture. This is on printing. It's one out of two lectures on printing. Um, printing. Print production is the last stage in the design process if you are designing for print. Often you can design just digitally and your work never sees a piece of paper except for your proof that you do while you're, while you're working. But more often than not, your work will be printed in some capacity. So you have to know about digital as well as print. So knowing print techniques and how to prepare your artwork for the press is critical to making sure that the work that you spent so much time on um, looks great, that the final product looks the way you wanted it to look. So uh, in order to give you a little more of a background on printing, I have a fabulous video. And I'm gonna put it the on. ability to the duplicate ability to and reproduce text and image has been vital in both the evolution and development of human intelligence. The earliest known examples of reproducing text trace back to around 3500 BC, where Egyptians created small round cylinders with inscriptions engraved into hardened clay, which, when rolled onto wet clay, would leave an impression. But depending on your definition, this might not be considered as printing. The first known technique for printing was in AD 220, where Chinese monks painted carved wooden blocks with ink and then stamped the design onto textiles and paper. Europe thought this was pretty cool, yeah, pretty cool and jumped on the bandwagon, printing cloth patterns and playing cards. A Chinese inventor expanded on this idea by creating the first movable type system using ceramic blocks that each had a letter protruding from them. He was able to arrange them into whatever combination he needed to print a page. Ink and paper was then placed on top and rubbed against the type. This design was improved on for hundreds of years with the addition of harder materials like bronze. Until Europe again jumped on the bandwagon and ditched their wood blocks for metal type systems. Ah, oh, to hell with this. Until they got lazy and a German goldsmith named Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press in 1440. This used the same principle as the movable type system, but added hinged boards and a press to squeeze the paper against the ink in one fast movement. The result was a much more accurate and faster way of reproducing work. The lowered cost of producing books revolutionized printing and ushered in a new age of intelligence. Oh, indubitably. This form of printing evolved to allow the reproduction of images as well, by using different methods of etching a design such as mesotint, which is the process of roughening a metal plate with a small tool with metal teeth on it. Ink sticks to the small scratches on the metal and the plate is then passed through a printing press. Other methods of etching included the use of acids and chemicals. Oh. Flatbed printing was all well and good, but a few people decided it wasn't efficient enough and moved to rotary and cylinder printers, which rolled a plate around a drum. Paper was then fed between the drum and the impression cylinder, which replaced the screw press from Gutenberg's printing press. This new and more efficient way of printing allowed for newspapers and other extra, media to be extra, quickly and mass-produced. It was also a lot cheaper, which allowed for a wider audience. In 1904, an American paper manufacturer noticed that when he forgot to load paper into the press, it would print onto the rubber impression cylinder below, and was actually a lot sharper than the regular print. So he created a new machine with an extra cylinder and acted like it was all intentional. This was the first offset printing press, and thanks to small improvements over the years, it is still to this day the most commonly used method for large volume paper printing. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe and visit us on expresscards.com.au. All right, there you go. Everything you ever wanted to know about the history of printing. Okay, and in order to give you even more background, I want you to see some real life um, printing presses in action as opposed to little uh, animations. Uh, I always had hoped with this class to do a class trip to a printer so you saw some presses in action and all this would be a little more clear, but it doesn't really happen with everyone's schedules. But anyhow, this is the next best thing. So here we go. Offset lithographic printing. It is more than just operating a machine. You need to study the entire process, its structure, its properties, and to understand the interaction between the water, ink, and paper. The design of the image and text is laser etched and transferred onto multiple sheets of aluminium called the press plate. One press plate is mounted to a cylinder in each printing unit. 
This machine has six printing units. Each unit prints one colour. Colour printing typically uses ink of four colours, cyan, magenta, yellow and black. The colour model CMYK. For this job we will be using four of the printing units. The stack of paper is lifted into position. A sheet separation unit separates the paper with jets of air or a vacuum to ensure that only one sheet is sent through the press at any one time. As the press plate rotates, its first point of contact is the dampening unit. This has a mixture of water and other chemicals. This dampens the non-image area of the press plate. The press plate then passes the inking unit, starting from the ink fountain, the ink will pass through multiple rollers called a roller train, which then sticks to the image area of the press plate. It is then passed to the blanket cylinder, which squeezes the water and the inked image area is picked up. It is then passed to the final cylinder, called the impression cylinder. The paper runs between the impression cylinder and the blanket cylinder, pressing the image onto the paper. The paper will then run through the transfer drums. Each cylinder is equipped with grippers that pick up the paper from the previous cylinder and transfer it to the next. Once the prints have passed through each unit, they will then be dried with hot and cool air and placed on the delivery pile. And that is the process of offset lithographic printing. Thank you for watching. Okay, so there's some background on offset lithographic, again, also known as traditional printing. And so traditional and digital are the two, the, um, I mean, they're not, let's say, the, the two that play against each other. They're not enemies, they're just different. Um, digital is new as of the 90s. Um, and Offset's been around for um, hundreds of years. So uh, to give you a little bit of information on the difference between the two, I have yet another little film. But after that, after I say this, um, <laughs> digital presses, you saw, you saw ink, ink go into the wells of the printing press in the video. The main difference between digital, technically, the main difference between a digital and a an, uh, Offset uh, printing press is the use of ink versus the use of toner on a digital press we, it's a toner based electro photography uh, technology very much like uh, desktop laser printers like the ones we have in class so that's sort of the main difference um, so with that said
Okay, so I think there actually is one more video, but it's not for a little bit yet. So where are we with this? With my, there we are. Okay, so print, digital printing advantages. Um, the movies hit on these, but fast time frame is probably the main thing. Think of it like doing um, some prints in class. They come out pretty immediately. So it's slightly more complicated at a, at a higher end digital printer, but not that much more. They generally use digital printing for runs under, eh, the numbers vary. I think your video said 250. I, I have 1,000 written down. I think under 1,000, even 2,000 gets much higher than that. It just becomes less economical to do it that way. Um, because what happens is you saw all the the, um, the traditional plates, the, uh, I'm sorry, the traditional printing, the offset printing requires a lot of setup and a lot of cleanup. But once the press is set up, um, running 500 or running 5,000 doesn't really make that much of a difference except for the price of the paper because everything is already up and running. So the price of each individual item or each printed piece goes down as you print more. Whereas with digital printing, the price for every item stays exactly the same. So you don't really get any savings. So it's great for low runs, but not large runs. Um, the great thing about digital is customization. So when you get those annoying marketing flyers in the mail that say, Dear Luke, blah, 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 you can thank digital printing for that. It's also great for um, any kind of publication, anything that updates their information frequently, anything that's personalized. It's great. Digital printing is um, great for that. Disadvantages. Um, not every print is the same. The first bullet says, um, that's overstated. That's not that much of a big deal. I've never had that really be a huge deal. But if you do have a client who has a, a color, a branded color, like a you know Pantone 32 is their red, and they always want it to look like Pantone 32, digital printing might not be the best way to go because there's going to be some variation in how the red looks. So it's just... Basically, digital printing is fast, but the quality is not quite as good. Um, yeah. Now, for offset printing, uh, advantages. Great for large runs. Overall clarity and quality is better. Faster, once the press is actually up and running, you can print true colors. Like I just mentioned, the um, Pantone 32. You can open a can of Pantone 32, pour it in there, and that's exactly how it's going to look on your printed page. You're not... Uh, building it. Uh, digital printing relies only on color builds. There is no such thing as an actual ink out of the can. Now don't get me wrong, cyan, magenta, yellow, and black are all out of a can. You saw that in the video, but to get any other color, you're mixing different versions, different combinations of those four process colors to get them. Whereas with a Pantone color, you're literally saying uh, you know, red 32 or Pantone, uh, get a purple, you know, in the 400s, I say the grays, 600s, um, you just open the can and pour it in. So you get a specialty color that way. You can add special finishes and varnishes in the offset um, printing dimension or world, but not in, um, in digital. And it works on a wider range of media, paper, fabric, plastic, wood, etc. So there's the advantages and disadvantages offset. Disadvantages, um, I think we pretty much covered those already. Okay, so here's a little quizzes for you. Digital or offset, which is more cost effective for short runs? Anybody, 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 Corey, anybody, anybody, Tegan? Nope, nope. Yes, you were right. Digital is better for short runs. The rule of thumb is over a thousand, good offset. All right, well done. Next, digital or offset, which can accommodate larger paper size? Anybody? No, I know you know this. Come on. Ah, it's actually a bit of a trick question. Um, <clears throat> most digital presses can handle 14 by 20, as it says there. That's their st a standard digital press. Most offset presses can go much higher than that. However, there's a such thing as a large format digital printer um, that can go to like the size of a, almost the size of a billboard. I mean, gig a gigantic size. So technically digital can do larger paper, but you need a specialty digital press to do it. Your run of the mill 
corner printer is not going to have um, a large format is the right term, even though I spelled it wrong on there. Good Lord, I'm a bad, bad typist. Um, they're not going to have a large format one. They're going to have your standard digital press. So this is a trick question. Digital or offset? If you want to use Pantone colors. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Anybody? Anybody? Victory? Mari? Offset, you were right. You were all right. If you want to do it, the uh, the whole thing I just explained about the, the ink out of the can, that's Pantone colors. If you want to use unusual paper or interesting finishes. John, one of the Johns. Oh, you're right, offset. Specialty finishes, surfaces, uh, you can do more unique sizes. You just have a lot more customization available in the offset sphere than you do in digital. And that was all for that round of offset or digital Jeopardy. Okay, so this is another um, video, the last one here, and this is just a little, just a little bit of fun, but it's to give you some insight on how lucky you are to be a designer in this day and age and not when this gentleman who started, who's roughly my age, uh, start at the same time and how it was my first few years. Started in 1989 and it wasn't until, well, it was pretty quick, about by 91, 92 we had Max, um, but there was still a few years there where we had to do the traditional way. So I'm going to let him explain that to you. <clears throat> you know, 30 years ago design was entirely different. It used to be all analog and all physical. When I look out on the landscape today and I see that, you know, everybody knows what Helvetica is, 12 year olds have a concept of what typefaces are and rules or any of the terms that we used to use. It's amazing to me because it used to be such a small group that knew how to manage this physical labor to do any project. So I'm gonna take, for example, this print ad and try to show what the process would be to recreate something like this. Now imagine I don't have this to begin with. I've gotta sketch this out and, and put it down to paper. So I've already done a bunch of hand-drawn sketches and kinda of gotten the flavor of, well, I want a big image and I think I'll have a headline here and this here. We're gonna set this aside and walk through how to do this. Now the first thing I need to know is how big this is. Now I've already measured it and I've decided it is 10 by 12. So using these rapidographs, which were these very fine pens. Now on the end of all the rapidographs is a numeral. This is 0 .80. Zero. .80 is reflecting the term that this is a .80 rule, just like you would have a .25 rule or .5 rule or a one point rule in, in Photoshop or InDesign or Illustrator. Um, there is no such thing in these as a .175 rule. They are all rounded numbers, which is why we base those on that today. Now these pens were a mess, frankly. Um, you filled them up yourself with ink, and you can see I'm already getting ink all over my hands. Um, they came out of this, like this. And in there, I'm not taking it out because it'll fly all over the place, is ink that I have filled up with this little container. And the ink flows through here until it dries out. And then I have to wash it and make sure nothing's dried up in there and do it again. So I've used my rapidograph and I've, I've already measured out the size of this ad and I've used my T-square and my triangle to draw these lines. And I've made sure that it's all squared up and nice and neat. And then I've used my, my triangle to draw the other sides as well. Not as simply as setting up a document and calling it nine by 12. It's like I had to know exactly what size it was. If I got that wrong, it'd go off and the art would be the wrong size and it wouldn't work. So now that I've figured out the size of my piece, and I have my rough sketch of what I want to do, I've probably talked to a photographer and I've said, you know, um, um, you know, Betty, I, I need a photograph of, of this young lady and, and I want her to hold a camera um, and I'd love her to have a red background. And, and the photograph has been shot. I've gone through a bunch of choices with the photographer and, and landed on the one that I like. And she then has sent me over a, a copy of one. And it's just a black and white Xerox. Just a cheap thing that I can work with. And I can crop it any way I want. 
And of course, to crop it, I'm going to have to figure that out. I don't, I don't have the digital tool to do cropping. I'm just going to have to decide, hmm, that looks, yeah, she's better cropped in. Maybe I should get rid of a little bit more of the hair. Once I figured that out, I'm ready to place her down. And we had the, the fun job of working with things like rubber cement. And we would put that on the back of these things to get a sense of, well, let's see, how will this work? So I brush it down. And I don't have to put too much on it, obviously, because it just has to last until I show it to the client. I put my rubber cement down, and I'm ready to lay her down. Now, I also need to mathematically know how wide this is, because there's no guides. And I can't depend on a center tool to tell me exactly where it is. I have to really check it myself. Now, if I didn't like this, if I'm like, yeah, it's a little too low or a little too high, I can always pick it up. That's the undo feature. You get to just pick this up and say, well, let's like slide her down a little bit. After a day, it's not gonna be that easy once it's dried, but while I'm doing it, it's no problem. So I've got the image down. Yeah, that looks swell. I'm happy with it. Now, in order to get type, it wasn't a matter of like type it in and you get to see, boy, that's, that looks swell in Helvetica. I had to sort of have a sense of what I wanted. Well, gee, do I like Helvetica? Do I want Garamond? I'm not sure. I would take manuscript copy, which was typewritten out, and I would write on it Helvetica, 24 point, um, you know, on 24 points of letting. And I'd send that to a typographer, and the typographer or the typesetter would send it back to me typeset. So they, I'd get these pieces of paper, and I'd have to trim them out, um, and it took about 24 hours to get some type back. So from the time I wrote it up, I told her it, I got this. And because it takes so long, I want to get as many choices as I can. So I don't have to wait another 24 hours if I don't like this. So I have it set by that typesetter in different sizes, and I have it set in different fonts so that I can look at it and say, oh yeah, that Garamond looks pretty good. Or you know what, it's not big enough. Well, I have my 24 point Garamond. That looks better. But you wanted to have those choices. And it wasn't simply a matter of change font. It was a 24 hour process, it, it was manual. If I didn't like the kerning on this, if I was like, oh, the letter spacing looks funny, guess what? I get to take my X-Acto knife, cut it out by hand, and slowly shift things over, which is not fun, but I have done that for many hours. I've got my headline, got my, my image down. Clients also asked for some additional images. So he's provided me with these images of these slide carousels and, and projectors. Now, the original image came with a background. I didn't like the background. I wanted it silhouetted. So the only way to silhouette something was to take the image and then this stuff that we called ruby lith. And the ruby lith is this red film. So we make a mask with this, which is why in Photoshop, when you make a mask, it appears as red because it's emulating the ruby lith concept. And I would take the ruby lith and I'd lay it down on top of my image with the full thing, and I would have to manually trim out that silhouette. So I've done a really snappy job trimming this out, let's pretend that, and I've, I've gotten back my image, which looks beautiful, silhouetted on white, and I can decide then where I want these to go. So once again, I've got these little Xeroxes that let me know where they go. They're not in color, so I have to imagine what it looks like in color. Um, because it would be too expensive to try to make color prints at this point if I were going to cut them up and move them around and try different things. And so I'm happy with my layout. Now I take this to my art director or the client and I show it to them and, and they say, well, we like that a lot. It's looking really good, but we think that model has a funny blemish. Is there anything we can do about that? So I'll call the photographer and say, she's got a blemish. Now, it's not a digital file. It's an actual transparency or a print photograph. So the photographer will then take an airbrush, which is a physical object, and they will go in and airbrush all of these pieces on her. It was very expensive, but it was worth it if it was a really important ad or something that had to be fixed. Now the other thing that might have happened is I've shown this to the client or the art director. The client says, you know what? I think that type needs to be underlined because it's really important. I don't have time to send out for more type. I don't have 24 hours. It has to go to the printer today. So there was this stuff called Letraset, and it was rubbed out. Now, I could either use my rapidograph and try to draw the rule, but it had to be perfect. No changes at all in thickness, and that's tricky. Or I could use the Letraset. 
And the letter set were great. I could say, okay, again, where do I want it? I would measure down. I would use my triangle and T-square to make sure it's exactly square. And then that would get rubbed down and I would have my burnisher and I would rub this down until I got what I wanted. Now, this is down there permanently, so I can change it. And then you had to hope it stuck. And you picked it up, and it did, good. Now, you can see, there's cracks in it, it's not pretty, it never was actually ever flawless. He might also say, you know, I don't like that headline font. Again, I don't have time, so what can I do? I have Letraset, and I know, well, I've got this Helvetica in 42 point in my drawer. What if he, maybe that'll work, he'll like that. And I can do the same thing. Now the end product is going to be not terribly pretty. And there's always a chance he may want something else that's a little fancier, like, gee, it wouldn't be swell if, the, if we had a beautiful French curve in here. Well, there's no Bezier tools. So I have this whole box of French rules which make these kinds of curves. And I can lay this down on the image, and I can trim it out, and I'll mark, well, let's see, this is exactly where I want that French curve to be this shape here. Mark it beautifully. And then I get to take my ruby lith again and try to perfectly trim it out to that exact rule. So again, it's a physical and manual labor tool, but you had to be pretty good at it. And in my very first job, the, the art director didn't even trust X-Acto knives. She said they're too clumsy and too fat. So we had to either use surgical scalpels or raw razor blades. Those are not fun to play with. So, you know, you had to be very good about it. Now I have all my pieces done. I, my whole layout is finished. This is the final document. This is a mechanical. Now the mechanical, has to get overlaid with instructions to the printer, make this red, make this white, make these color images, tells them exactly what I want to have happen here. And then I give it to a messenger and they messenger it over to the, to the printer. Now if something happens to it along the way, if it falls off a truck in the rain and gets ruined, I have to start all over again from scratch. There's no backup of this. So the printer gets it, he has all my instructions, he can put them together and if he's a good printer, I get something really nice just like this. So you can see it was a process that took a lot of manual labor. It was physical skills and everyone had their own particular way of doing it. But it wasn't just this everyday, all over the place thing that everyone's mother could do. This was an actual graphic art skill. Um, hence the, the insularness of the profession at the time, which was great, but maybe it's better now that it's much more open and everybody knows what a font is. All right, and everything he said was true. Did not really exaggerate very much in that, or at all. Um, the one thing that was different than I used to do is we actually had a thing called a waxer. So instead of using the rubber cement like he did, it was a machine that you put through, uh, it was automatic, you fed the um, page of type into it, or anything, and it put a layer, a thin layer of wax on the back of it, and then you could lay that down on the board and position it. Um, so anyhow, okay, moving on. If I can keep going, or is that my last one? That might be my, oh, that is, that, that is the end of this. That's the end of part one. Um, so hopefully uh, you got something out of that and enjoyed some of it. And uh, make sure you do the quiz on this um, as soon as possible and look forward to, uh, printing part two. Catch you later. Bye.